Edinburgh Castle, one of the oldest fortified sites in Europe. With a long, rich history as a royal residence, military garrison, prison and fortress, it is alive with many exciting tales. When you climb Castle Hill, you will walk in the footsteps of kings, queens, soldiers and even the odd pirate or two. I'm Mary. I've been a tour guide here at Edinburgh Castle for four years and I'm so excited to be taking you on a tour around this fascinating place. Welcome to Edinburgh Castle. Before we head inside the castle, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about where we actually are. We are in the city of Edinburgh, capital city of Scotland, and the castle is built on Castle Rock, part of an extinct volcano. So this site has dominated the surrounding landscape for millions of years. When you first approach the castle, one of the first sights that will greet you is the impressive gatehouse, which sits just over the dry ditch. This view of the castle is perhaps the most famous, particularly considering that it is used as the backdrop for the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo, an event staged here on the Esplanade every August in front of thousands of visitors from across the world. On the gatehouse itself, you will see two figures flanking the drawbridge. These are two of Scotland's most famous heroes, King Robert the Bruce and Sir William Wallace. Here, the two statues guard the entrance to our castle. Looming over the gatehouse is the towering Half Moon Battery. Built after the Lang siege in the 1570s, it provides another level of fortification for the castle. The curved wall juts commandingly over the landscape, rising high on the east side of the castle. As we walk through the lower ward of Edinburgh Castle, we pass many of the defences that once held her strong. Edinburgh Castle is one of the most besieged sites in British history, with at least 26 individual sieges battering at her doors, and yet not one succeeded through brute force alone. These defences include the Portcullis Gate, which to this day sits above visitors' heads as they pass underneath. We're now in the middle ward of the castle, and this is the Argyle Battery. Here, you'll find the first of the many cannon that line our walls. These are 18-pounder naval weapons, so they've never been fired from within the castle. However, there are two cannon on site today that have been fired, but I'll tell you about them later on in the tour. Near to the Argyle Battery is the entrance for the National War Museum of Scotland. Run by the National Museums of Scotland, this museum tells the history of Scotland's military past, from the creation of the first standing army in the 1600s to present day. Inside, you will find intriguing stories, including the tale of the elephant. That's right, an elephant, who was a regimental mascot here at the castle in the 19th century. Behind me is the home of the Governor of Edinburgh Castle, a post currently held in 2021 by Major General Alistair Bruce. However, this home has been used by governors of the castle for over 250 years. Sat just behind the Governor's house is the New Barracks, a rather ironic name in modern terms, as the building was completed in 1799. The building now houses the regimental headquarters for the Royal Regiment of Scotland, alongside other branches of military service. It is also here that you will find the regimental museums for the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards and the Royal Scots, detailing their long histories. Edinburgh Castle is a working garrison and still has an active military presence, from the barrack block here to the royal gun salutes which occur throughout the year. Beyond Hockhill, almost hidden from view, you will find the prisons of war. This is a series of vaults that in the 1700s were transformed to hold prisoners of war. 
as you see them today, they have been recreated to represent the period around 1781, when we held prisoners from France, Spain, the Netherlands, Ireland, and even the American Wars of Independence. Although the vaults represent the period around the American Wars of Independence, our prisons have had prisoners from other conflicts such as the Jacobite Risings, and they've even held a pirate or two over the years. All throughout the prisons, graffiti from previous inhabitants can be found, giving us a tiny insight into their lives whilst captive here in the castle. There's even an original Stars and Stripes from the very beginnings of the United States of America. It's just amazing that these etchings have survived over 250 years. After escaping from the prisons, we make our way up Hawk Hill and through Fugue's Gate. Now, no one really knows why it's called Fugue's Gate, but there are plenty of theories out there about it. The first is that it's named after the architect. The second, that it's named after the old fogies, or the old soldiers in Scots, who used to man the final defences. And the third, and perhaps most credible of the lot, is that it is named after the weather because here in Scotland, you can never depend on a sunny day. And in fact, the fog often rolls in and even hides the castle from view. Fugue's Gate is the final line of defence of the fortress before you reach the upper ward and the royal heart of the castle. The first royal building you will encounter, however, is rather unassuming. It's a tiny little building that sits on its own, but this is called St Margaret's Chapel and it's actually the oldest building still standing within the castle. St Margaret was Queen Consort to Scottish King Malcolm Canmore in the late 1000s. They had eight children together and four of them went to become kings of Scotland themselves. But it was her youngest son, David I, who built this chapel in her memory in the year 1130. The reason that the chapel is the oldest building in the castle by several hundred years is because in the early 1300s, the Scots were fighting a war of independence against England and the English actually held Edinburgh Castle for almost 20 years during this period. But in 1314, the Scots lay siege to the front door but couldn't get in. So in the dead of night, a soldier called Sir Thomas Randolph took only 30 of his men. They scaled the back cliff of the castle, snuck down to Portcullis Gate, where they killed the guards and opened the doors, allowing the rest of the Scottish force in, and they took the castle back from English control. However, they didn't have enough men to defend the site. So their king, King Robert the Bruce, instead ordered that Edinburgh Castle be destroyed Luckily for us, King Robert was a very religious gentleman and he decided that Margaret's tiny little chapel would be the one building that would survive. So now, this unassuming little chapel stands not only in memory of our saint, but also of the old castle that once stood on these rocks. Earlier, I mentioned that there are two cannon on site that have been fired from within our walls. This is the first. Her name? is Mons Meg, and she is one of the largest cannon ever made. Built in 1449, she was gifted to King James II on the occasion of his wedding in 1457. She has been used for over 200 years and was primarily a siege weapon. She had the capacity for 150 kilogram cannonballs and had a range of almost two miles. Her final firing occurred in 1681, on the occasion of the Duke of Albany, later King James VII and II's birthday. But on that day, the gunpowder proved too strong for this 200-year-old weapon, and her barrel burst, leaving her with damage that can still be seen to this day. This is the Scottish National War Memorial 
found in Crown Square. Converted in the 1920s, this building remembers the Scots who fought and died from the First World War to present day. It's still an active war memorial, and we have been very lucky to be allowed to come inside today and film some of this building to show off its fantastic memorial. All around the room is a series of books. These books contain the names of the Scots who died. All in all, it is thought there's around 200,000 names within our memorial. The most awe-inspiring piece of art in the memorial can be found inside the shrine. This is St. Michael the Archangel, patron saint of soldiers and sailors. And here, he keeps a watchful eye over our soldiers. I would always keep an eye open for some of the more unusual memorials on our walls. You see, it wasn't just humans that served during the wars. Our furry and feathered friends did their bit as well. So when you visit, make sure to keep your eyes open, because you never know where you might find one of our animal friends. As we leave behind the war memorial, there is one final figure sitting just above the doorway. This is Ravai, the bringer of peace. The idea behind his position is that as we leave behind the painful memories of war, we walk out into a hopeful new day. Across the square from the War Memorial, you will find the Great Hall. This banqueting hall was built in the early 1500s to celebrate the wedding of King James IV of Scotland and Margaret Tudor. Margaret was the older sister of King Henry VIII of England, and this marriage was seen as a symbol of peace between the two nations. Now that we're inside, if you look up at the ceiling, you'll notice a very particular piece of architecture. This is a hammer beam roof. It means that there's not one single metal nail in its construction. The entire thing is held together with wooden pegs and has been so for over 500 years. Just below the wooden ceiling, you will see a series of stone corbels around the room. These are divided into Queen Margaret's side and King James's side. On Margaret's side, there are depictions of Venus, the Tudor Rose and the Green Man, a pagan symbol of fertility. James's side is represented with the thistle, the lion rampant of Scotland and a shield containing the letters IR, which stand for the Latin Jacobus Rex or King James. The Great Hall was redesigned in the 1880s by Hippolyte Blanc, who was also responsible for the Gatehouse and the Argyle Tower. This was after several centuries of using the Great Hall as a military barracks, storeroom and military hospital at varying times. As part of the redesign, a large assortment of weapons were given to the castle on permanent loan from the Royal Armouries. However, these weapons do require a bit of upkeep and we're currently in the middle of a five-year conservation project. It shows perfectly how this castle continues to protect and conserve the site for future generations to come and enjoy. The final building in Crown Square is the Royal Palace. The first room that is open to the public is perhaps the most important room in the entire site. For this, is the home of the Honours of Scotland, Scotland's crown jewels. Our jewels are the oldest complete set in Western Europe and comprise of three parts. The sceptre, made in 1494, the sword from 1507, and the crown, which was completed in 1540. The complete set was only truly used for a monarch's coronation four times. Mary, Queen of Scots, James VI, Charles I and Charles II, meaning that the jewels were last used on the 1st of January, 1651. Since then, they were retired as part of the Act of Union in 1707 in favour of the then newly created British Crown Jewels, housed in the Tower of London.
the jewels were sealed away within the old treasury room until 1818, when, after Sir Walter Scott's intervention, they were put on public display and have remained on show ever since, with the exception of during the Second World War, when they were hidden for safekeeping deep in the bowels of the ruined David's Tower. The final item in the Crown Room is the Stone of Destiny. Sometimes called the Stone of Schoon, this plain-looking lump of rock is the ancient coronation seat of the Scots, with the first recorded use in 843 AD, the stone was used by Scottish monarchs for centuries until it was stolen by Edward I of England in 1296. After being moved to Westminster Abbey, it was used as part of English and later British coronations. The stone finally returned to Edinburgh in 1996. 700 years after it was originally taken. The stone is the only piece of the honours still in use today and it will return to Westminster Abbey for any future coronations. Whilst I said that the stone lived in Westminster Abbey for 700 years, it did have a rather memorable three months where it went missing thanks to four Scottish students. On Christmas Eve 1950, they snuck into the abbey, dragged the stone from its resting place, dropping it to the floor and accidentally breaking the stone in two. They managed to remove the stone to Scotland and hid it for three months until it was finally left at Arbroath Abbey. The stone was fully repaired and later returned to London, with none of the students ever being prosecuted. Alongside the Honours of Scotland, the Royal Palace is home to the Royal Apartments, rooms that have been used by several monarchs for their stays within the castle. But perhaps the most famous occasion of use was when Mary Queen of Scots sacrificed the comfort of nearby Holyrood House to live safely within these walls for three months whilst heavily pregnant, finally giving birth to her son, the future King James VI of Scotland and I of England, in the tiny little annex room adjacent to her bedroom. The room may not look particularly royal, but it was in this tiny space that Mary spent much of her labour, finally giving birth to the babe on the 19th of June, 1566. The apartments were extensively refurbished to celebrate King James's 50th anniversary as King of Scotland in 1617 and the decoration that can be seen today throughout the rest of the rooms shows the grandeur of this design. Remember how Mons Meg was one of only two cannons fired from within our sight? Whilst Mons Meg hasn't fired for centuries, the second cannon has a far more contemporary history. This is the one o'clock gun. The one o'clock gun is a 105mm light artillery field gun, still in service with the British Army. But here in the castle, it continues a tradition that began on the 7th of June, 1861. The gun is an audio complement for the time ball on Carlton Hill which was designed as a time signal for the Port of Leith to allow sailors to set their timepieces to the correct local time. We continue to fire the gun every day, except for Sundays, Good Friday and Christmas Day. And when I say every day, yes, that includes today. Well, there's nothing like going out with a bang. Thank you for joining me today on our tour. If you would like any more information about the castle or are indeed planning a trip to visit us, please visit www 
edinburghcastle.scot for more information. And don't forget to join us for more Castle Fest events over the next two weeks. Until then, thank you and goodbye.